Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 183, Disconnect. Discussing the gap between games you want to play and those that will actually get played, as well as our much-anticipated review of Scythe. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. So tonight we're talking about a problem many of us hobby gamers face, a disconnect between the games we want or the games we buy and the games that actually get played and hit our tables. After that, we've got our highly anticipated review of Scythe from Stonemeyer Games, a game that reinforced my belief that you can't judge a game based on only a couple of plays with only one group. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a few comments on our Quezzle Amazing Cappadocia review from Gail Francher, who started by writing... Thank you for putting in the pauses. I'm smiling at the bottom of the box like an idiot, albeit a happy one. Such a clever thing they did with this puzzle, and I would have never found it without you. Awesome. The next day, they wrote again to say, Your review here and YouTube review are incredibly helpful. I still never got the final balloon scene. I'm curious about the final clue. I don't want to ruin it for others. How do I get the answer? And then, about 45 minutes later, they wrote again to say, I just figured it out. Sorry. Patience, Padawan, the master says. <laughs> See, this right here is why I called out our Quezzle review as my favorite of the past year. This is a perfect example of someone getting more out of something they bought due to our review. The I'm smiling at the bottom of the box like an idiot part in particular. Like, that made me smile. That was awesome, because that was the best part. That was the moment for me as well. Where I'm like, okay, this isn't just a jigsaw puzzle with some gimmicks. Yeah, the puzzles built into the puzzle kind of silly, but now I finally see the the game or or, or the, what they were actually trying to do and the brilliance of it. I can only hope this review continues to get views and more people discover the joy in that puzzle slash game. Thank you for the comments, Gail, and I'm glad you finally finished your copy of Quezzle. Well, next, a couple of comments on our Lost Ruins of Arnak review, starting with Dan Eisenhut who writes, played it once on Board Game Arena. It was okay, but the fact that I haven't played it a second time should give my opinion of it. And Mike Z commented, the Expedition Leader's expansion is very high in my book, well worth the cost. This provides variability that really shine. Each temple track feels unique and interesting. The players are also very different from one another. Every time you play, you see people doing stuff you can't and think, it's an awesome ability. I want to do that. <laughs> With six characters, it means you have lots to try out. Well, thanks for your comments, uh, Dan and Mike. I want to address Dan's uh, specifically by saying, I hope you get a chance to try it in person. Because Arnak is not a game you want to learn on Board Game Arena, as Sean discovered. Yeah, I would go so far as saying that if you've only played it on Board Game Arena, you haven't really played it yet. Yeah, I agree. As for Mike's comment, we know, we know, the expansion's supposed to be great. Uh, I think you just proved something I said in that review about people coming out of the woodwork to point out the expansion. I'm honestly yet to hear anything bad about it. But with our growing pile of obligations, thanks Gen Con, I have a feeling that expansion may be a Christmas or birthday gift at this point. So we probably won't be talking about it till next year, but you never know. Yeah, so uh, I gotta say, the one thing about that expansion that bothers me is... I don't know if I like the the the, the way he just he describes the, uh, the, uh -huh. the sort of asymm asymmetry, but we'll have to see. Let's stick with pairs of comments, this time about our commands and colors Napoleonics unboxing. Bill Hatfield writes, I much prefer ancients over Napoleonics when it comes to mm -hmm. commands and colors games. I hope hopefully you find both enjoyable. And Irf Bentinson right, said, Welcome to the ranks of people patiently waiting <laughs> the grand battle. Well, thanks for the comments, Phil and Ulf. Um, I personally think it's gonna, I'm going to prefer Ancients as well. We'll see. Um, once I play it, maybe I'll change my mind. I, I did hold off on getting Napoleonics for a long time. I got a really good deal on it, though. 
Now, as for Ol's comment, he's mentioning a long promised expansion that still hasn't seen the light of day. But it's actually the seventh expansion for CNC Napoleonics. And at this point, I haven't even played the base game. So I think I've got a ways to go before any impatient hits. I do feel sorry for anyone who has been waiting. Hopefully, GMT gets it out there soon. Well, let's do two more, including another comment from Phil Hatfield, who commented on our Ghost Betwixt unboxing to say, looks pretty neat. I will mention it to my FLGS and see if they're planning on getting it. Cool. Oh, I'm glad to see we've already inspired someone to pick up this modern dungeon crawler. Like, I think Phil will like it based on what I know of his taste of the games. I'm personally looking forward to trying Scenario 2 now that we beat Scenario 1, but it's going to be a couple weeks before we can dive back into that one. And sticking with us, inspiring people to go shopping, Bobby Kotcher right, commented on our Drinking Quest review to say, just ordered, should be here by August 20th. Nice. Oh, thanks for letting us know, Bobby. I always appreciate when people are like, hey, I bought this because of you. That makes me feel good. Well, I think that's where we'll stop for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One quick announcement before we move on. You have exactly one week left to enter to win one of our favorite games. That's today that we're recording on Wednesday. If you're listening to this on the podcast version that dropped Tuesday morning, you got probably about 24 hours or so, or whatever, 24 plus 12, I think it ends at midnight. So you got a little less time. We went through our reviews and picked the four best games we could find that were readily available in print and at a price we could afford and decided to offer up one copy of one of them to a Bellhop fan located in the U.S. or Canada. Now, those four games are Fun Fair from Good Games Publishing, Lost Ruins of Arnak from CGE, Space Base from AEG, and of course, the Azul Killer, Gorinto from Grand Gamers Guild. Check out the pinned post over at tabletopbellhop.com to enter. Be sure to check out ways to get bonus entries on the Rafflecopter forum, as this has proven to be one of our most popular giveaways yet, with lots of entries and it's still going. Good luck. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. Tonight's question was picked by our awesome hotel guest level Patreon patrons and comes from one of those patrons, Andrew Dacey, who probably voted for his own question. <laughs> Andrew asks, how do you handle when you've got a disconnect between the types of games that you'd like to own and play with the types of games you can actually get to the table? What brought this on for me was the Voidfall Kickstarter. I was thinking it looked really cool and was really excited about sinking my teeth into a really meaty, heavy 4X space game. But then I realized that I would likely never be able to get this to the table with a group of people that would actually want to play such a heavy game. And that typically it's only the lighter games in our collection that get played at all. And I have a hefty shelf of shame of heavier games that never get played. But at the same time, I want to play heavier games like this. All right, before we continue, I'm going to point out to Sean that Pandora is right there. Oh, that's unfortunate. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to clear that up. And I don't know what else we can put up there. Maybe you can put a box or something to cover it or whatever. Hey, Todd, free advertising. Not that you <laughs> paid us for the other advertising. We're just going to leave it up in the corner every show. Yeah, see if you yeah, get some we, extra see sales. See if you can find the... the, uh, the yeah, uh, find the copy of Pandora in our next episode. <laughs> All right, getting back to the actual topic. <laughs> if you want to know about Pandora Total Destruction, tune in to episode 182 of the Tabletop Aiming Podcast, which should be just before this one on your podcatcher of choice or in your YouTube stream. There, now we've thrown it in. Now it fits. All right, back to the topic. So first off, thanks, patrons, for helping us choose a topic this week. And thanks, Andrew, for being one of those patrons, though I don't actually know if Andrew voted or not. And I got to say, this is a great question. So thank you for this question, Andrew. I like the, the detail he put into it. I like these longer questions where it kind of explains why they're asking the question. So I appreciate that. So I think this is a problem. Everyone listening, like, I, I don't think you have to be in the board game hobby or the RPG hobby, for that matter, for very long to find this gap, uh, the, the gap between the games we want and we're excited about 
and often spend our money on and the games that actually get played. To me, this is very common. And I don't think Andrew feels like the one man out. But if in case you do, this is not a you problem. This is, a, I, I guess, a hobby problem. This is a common occurrence in, in this particular hobby. And again, I, I, I feel as this, this applies to all tabletop. This isn't a specific board gaming topic, uh, although Voidfall was a board game, a 4X board game. But I think this also applies to role playing games. It does. I think luckily... Or not, you know, depending on how you look at it. Luckily, I think the 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 problem is more expensive with board games. Uh, generally, you're going to be buying some books you don't want, but you're not going to be dropping $150 on that big 4X game right. that isn't going to get to the table. So, you know, maybe over time you can possibly add up higher on RPG just because you're doing a lot of smaller purchases. But uh, it definitely does happen to both of them. I think arguably my superhero collection probably started as that and just kind of shifted over to justifying it as a collection instead. And then uh sidelong Gantz to uh invisible sun. I think it was called from Monty cook games, which I think was $600. Wow. <laughs> Something like that. They're out there. Yeah, there yeah, are, there are expensive the black box RPGs sets and yeah, the yeah, black yeah. boxes. I don't know. I, 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 th I, th I don't think it's as, as exclusive to role board games as you might think, especially when you're talking about big over the top Kickstarters. Yeah. Fair. And I got to say, like, some of this is just it, it's expected, honestly, because we've talked about this since getting some numbers. I don't even know how many years ago it was now. Uh, the number of games that are released every year, the, the number of games that are out there. Yeah, there are, are a ridiculous number. I, I think it was 4000 released a game at, at Gen Con like last weekend. It's it's ridiculous number of games. Yeah. And not every game is for everyone. And that's awesome. Like, no, it shouldn't be. Everyone has their own tastes, their own groups, their own things they're going to enjoy. So it's great that there's that amount of diversity. But it also means that not every game is going to be for everyone, including your small group of gamers you hang out with or perhaps your large group of gamers. Yeah. And I think this is one thing. Now, things have changed slightly over the pandemic. Because I think one of the major groups of people who were having this problem were solo gamers uh, or people yeah. with with no groups or small groups or, or groups that didn't happen. Because we are getting more solo functions in games, there is a lot more where even if you don't have the group, you can do yourself. That's true. Unfortunately, your giant 4X games are still going to be pretty limited. There are not too many giant, uh, of, the, of those big old Twilight Imperiums out there that have automata. I wonder if the, there might be a, a solo. I, I wonder if someone's done solo for TI. I'd be really surprised if they haven't. There's probably someone out there that's come up with something. So I got to say, some of us are lucky that, that, that you have a game group that all either either are willing to play anything, which is amazing. If you can find that group, hold on to them. Um, or you just like the same kind of games. Like if you're in an area with lots of gamers, you're probably going to gravitate and make friends with and end up hanging out with people like the same kind of games as you. But you got to be in a fairly large city with lots of gamers for that to even happen. It's great if it happens. Though I got to say, even if you've got your group of 4X heavy GMT uh, Hex Encounter 18XX gamers, there's probably at least one person in that group who every now and then wants to play a game of code names or, you know, would really like a Knight of Azul so their brain doesn't burn. I have a feeling that like even in a group where you think you all like the same kind of games, there's going to be people who prefer one type over another. Absolutely. And then sometimes it's it's a matter of, uh, you know, even in a bigger city, you aren't necessarily going to find those people or you mm -hmm. think you are or maybe <laughs> maybe you're happy playing things once in a while. Uh, I someone who may or may not be in our chat room right now <laughs> really loves 18 XX games. Yeah. But a lot of the times they're only going to be playing those at cons which is great if you can go to cons all the time, but all right. of a sudden when uh, a pandemic comes out of the blue and you aren't going to cons <laughs> anymore, all of a sudden you've got some games that aren't getting to the table anymore, even though you yeah. love them. Uh, but the opportunity for that has closed or your friends, you know, move away or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, there are lots of, of, of occasions that can cause this out of the blue. It may not always, it may not have been something that's been ongoing. It may be a sudden change of uh, yes. situation and because of that this is going to be more of a problem than others right having a game sit unplayed is bad i can't deny that 
it, it's I've got a pile of shame. Pile of shames. I, I refuse to call them shelf of opportunity. When, once the game's been there, say over three months, it's not opportunity anymore. It's shame. Like you bought this thing, play the dang thing. Why did you buy it in the first place? Maybe that's because of people, right? That's kind of what we're talking about tonight. There are other reasons, but I will always call mine my pile of shame or shelf of shame. I get it. If you want to be optimistic about those games, that's fair. That's fine. But I feel if you've got a game for a long enough time, you should feel some shame that you picked it up and didn't get it played. But looking past that, some people are going to be perfectly happy having a game that only gets played infrequently. Like Sean said, uh, Darkling Blight in the chat, who I'm not sure if they're here tonight, but one of our regular fans is a huge 18xx fan. They, well, I bet you he wishes he could play more often, <laughs> but is kind of perfectly fine going to special, you know, 18xx style events to getting to play those games. I know my own copy of Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition. That is there for an event. That is there so I can call up eight of my friends, plan ahead of time, order pizza at a certain time. Like, we, usually for that game, we've got to relearn how to play because it's been a year. We sit there and I, we get everything set up and everyone picks their factions and we get the board all set up and we reteach the rules. And then we order pizza and we all sit back and we can discuss the rules, right? Like any rules questions, do you get this? Do you understand how this works while we're snacking? And then we sit down and we get to it and we play. That happens when, when I was playing more regularly again before COVID was like once or twice a year. And I was cool with that. I was perfectly happy with my big copy with both expansions sitting there that I only got to play with every couple of years. And some people are going to be totally cool with that. Yeah, there's a lot of games out there that just aren't suitable for, for regular play. Um, you know, some people may have the space to to you know be playing Gloomhaven all the time, and mm -hmm. maybe even you know ideally leave they'd be able up. to leave it set up. Uh, but some people might not, and you may be at a point where oh, I can't take up the space and the time to play Gloomhaven, mm -hmm. so it's sitting on the shelf because you know it's going to take me an hour or two to get it all down and set up, and then we mm -hmm. got to go refresh the rules, and then we got to play for as many hours as we can, but we don't have that much time so let's play something else this week yeah. you know everyone wants to play gloomhaven but you have to find the time and space to be able to commit to it as well you know there's there's just so many things that can sometimes get in the way of of what we would love to be doing Yes, not just necessarily the people, right? Like yeah. Andrew's example is his people with him want to play light games, right? And so he doesn't get to play these bigger games. I like to call them event games, right? If I have to call up a, a different group than my regular game group and schedule a special night to do it, to me, that's an event game. And event games definitely fall on this. But I'm happy to own some event games that I only use a couple times. And I get it that some people aren't. But so far, what we've talked about are big games. Some groups have the opposite problem. For example, my group. Deanna doesn't want to play light party games 90% of the time. Yet we game with people who love those. Yep. Tori is a huge fan of lighter games. And it's it's funny because we've slowly introduced him to more heavier games. And he's he's starting to actually really enjoy some heavier games. And like Kat, when she first started gaming with us, hated worker placement games. We've now taught her the error of her ways. No, I don't mean to mean it that way. Well, but she they, also didn't understand, you know, she'd had some bad experiences. Yes. With certain <laughs> games. And and it takes time. And that's one of yeah. the things that I think can possibly help out our uh, our question asker here and other people is slow introductions. Mm -hmm. These people may not want to change and they may be unwilling to change and they may just want to stick with their small party games. That's fine. But they may also just not know what else is out there. They may not, yeah. you know, they if they think the difference is, you know, code names and Twilight Imperium. Mm. Well, no, they aren't going to want to play that big heavy game. Yeah. But if they suddenly, you know, learn about, you know, Catan or, you know, little or even easier than Catan, you know, the introduction games, uh, the hand holding games, the gatekeeping, the, the gate, not gatekeeping, but gateway. <laughs> gateway games that slowly can introduce people into something a little different um, and maybe up that difficulty level. And mm. maybe they decide it's not for them. And that's great. But. Maybe they also decide that they are up for something a little tougher, a little meatier, and you introduce that into your uh, your group's play, and you get a little bit more of what you're aiming for while still right. keeping a happy gaming group. But what I did want to point out is it could go the opposite way. 
you could have the one gamer in your group that always wants to play something heavy and maybe you start trying to get them to play a little medium heavy and then maybe we get them down to medium and you try to find some of those thinky filler engaging games to get them interested in so uh, my point there is just that this is a problem for all types of game groups and all types of games like i we tend to think of it as i can't get people to play the heavy big games but it's also I never get my copy of Telestrations played. Man, I would love to play some apples to apples, you know, and I just never get a chance to. I think it goes both ways. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's more a noticeable problem because we're, we as hobby gamers are used to struggling with family members, especially yes. who, you know, love their Monopoly and their silly little party games and, and haven't broken into the hobby games. And so that's something we experience a lot. But as soon as you move up from hobby gamer to, say, war gamer, uh, you're at a different level. And they're looking down at us hobby gamers going, oh, it's all you're only to play. <laughs> or, yeah. you know, uh, or the or looking amongst themselves going, oh, this is this is all we're willing to play. I want to play something. You know, I want to play Race for the Galaxy and not 18xx. Right. So, there's yeah, there's there's a huge variety there. And it's the causes. Uh, I think we sort of touched on some of them, but. Yeah. You know, the, a lot, what people know is one of the big ones uh, as, yeah. as, a, as far as the group goes um, and whether or not your group is, is interested is a lot of it is what you know. But some of it may actually be on the person who's having the problem, who, who's having the disconnect. Yeah, so I was going to say, I don't know problem is the right word, but yeah, the, the, the person, one, one the, of the questions the you should ask yourself, and this is kind of important, is why do you want this game? Especially if you know it's not going to get played, but we're we're trying to skip that. Why why do you think you're going to enjoy this game more than what's already out there? And especially when looking at Kickstarters, you got to kind of step back and look at it from a third person. And like, are you being? I'm, I'm going to use a bad term here to some people, but are you being manipulated? Like like, is the marketing working? Is it fear of missing out? Is is there something pressuring you to get this game that normally your group wouldn't enjoy, but you still feel the need for it? And I think taking that second, like, honestly, I think Kickstarters are kind of like um, when you go to adopt a pet, right? You go in and you're like, oh, I picked my cat. That cat's awesome. You're like, I want to take it home. You're like, nope. And you're like, what do you mean? Nope. I picked my cat. They're like, no, no. We want you to go home and sleep on it. If you still want the cat tomorrow, come back tomorrow. And I think more people should do that with Kickstarters. Like, I realize you can cancel, but once you cancel, you start getting the 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 sunk cost fallacy. You're like, yeah. well, I already backed it. I don't want to go cancel. That's a pain in the butt to cancel. And I think that's important. You don't want one of the ways to solve this problem is don't buy games you won't play. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's certainly a definite aspect of holding off. Uh, I think one of the examples that comes to mind for me personally is uh, back a couple of years, pre-pandemic, I guess, we were, you know, we were browsing Kickstarters and we came across this really cool looking Clash of the Titans sort mm -hmm. of Greek mythology game. And we had gone through the Kickstarter and it looked like this meaty adventure game with a bunch of, you know, gods versus monsters and all this fantastic stuff. And it was a big miniature game. And it, looked, it was like ridiculous miniatures that oh, like yeah. you could change and you <laughs> took parts off. And but but it looked like it was going to be as and... meaty enough game that, you know, Deanna, Deanna would really like it and you would like it. It was something that I thought we as a group would probably really be able to get into. Yeah. And then we we thankfully, <laughs> thank God, found an actual play of the game. We went out and and just out, hey, that's no, we that rated. Game. Or we rated, yeah, we rated, we rated an actual play of the game. And I had already put my money down on the Kickstarter. I was yeah. in. I thought this looked fantastic. And we rated a we rated a a stream that was an actual play of this game and watched them flipping through pages and referencing dozens of handouts and trying to analyze the rules and by the time the stream was over i was over at kickstarter canceling my pledge as fast as i could because it just it, it, there was no way we were ever going to play this thing oh. because it would have needed to stay set up on a table for months at a time just for us to be yeah. able to understand what was going on uh, it was a lifestyle, lifestyle, yeah, life, you know, gods versus monsters game, um, which isn't us uh, as as people who tried to follow our Gloomhaven streams uh, saw, you know, sometimes that it's just, you know, life interferes. Yeah. So so I think lesson one, tip number one is do your research, 
and don't buy games you know won't get played. Yeah. But that's only for saving money. That doesn't actually fix the disconnect <laughs> that you have in wanting the game. But I do say take a look at your want before you act on it. Like, like make sure that you really do want this. Uh, people doing marketing are amazing at getting you to to want things you may not necessarily. Well, no one needs them. They're hobby games. So I, I don't want to use the term need, but things you want really bad. Yeah. Um, are the exclusives actually worth it? Is uh, You know what? I'm not going to get into why you should back a Kickstarter or why you shouldn't or why you should wait. But just just second guess yourself anytime doing that. Yeah, I, again, you know, it's you you probably I mean, you may really, really want to play that that T.I., uh <laughs> and 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 you may agree you may think uh you may even come to the agreement after doing all your research that this you know 4x game is exactly what you're looking for but if you can't think of anybody else off the top of your head who is going to play it with you you need to take a step back yeah. you need to you need to check yourself uh and i mean and maybe you have the money and you want to be a collector. That's that's a different that's thing. Totally Collecting different is a different thing. This yeah. is these are games that you want to get on the table. Yeah. The the point of this is the disconnect from I want to play and I can't. And you so, need to make sure you know who your players are. Yes. So yeah, that's that's gonna be I'm leading into okay, what can you do? I think we talked enough about why, why, and yes, it exists and everyone suffers for it. What are some things you can do? And so so the first thing is don't buy games you won't play, that'll save you money, but Take like Sean's first com last comment there, like know your group. That's very important. One of the things too, though, is get to know your group. Don't assume just because Joe shows up every week going, let's play I'm trying to think of a party gaming it, Sagrada. So it's kind of mid-level, right? Let, let, let's get together and play Sagrada. And the next week they want to play Splendor and then they want to play Azul. And they seem to be in this abstract strategy, somewhat light, but thinky game funk. And you're like, man, I really wish we could sit down and play something heavier, but Joe always shows up with Sagrada and Azul in that. Well, maybe if you ask Joe, he's like, oh, I brought this because it's kind of light party games. And I thought we'd all like them. What I'd love to do is sit down for a game of Advanced Squad Leader. And you're like, what? You're into Advanced Squad Leader? Like, get to know your group. Have a conversation. This We say this way too often on this podcast, especially if RPGs are involved. Talk to your group. Uh, th this isn't like a put on the grown-up pants. It's a pretty simple one. Like, hey, folk, do you want to try something a little heavier? Hey, I'm thinking of back in this Kickstarter. You at all interested in checking this out? What do you think about this? Hey, we've been playing a lot of this style of game. How about we try something a little different next week? Yeah, no, absolutely. There, it's there. There's just something to be said, especially with gaming groups. Like if you were a gaming group that got together from your FLGS, for instance, yeah. um, you've probably connected over a certain genre or type of games. Uh, and you may have just never had as much interaction as you think yes. outside of that. Um, whereas, you know, if I, you know, I've grown up with Mo over the last 40 years and I think we know each other pretty well, but that's the rarity. Most of the time mm -hmm. you're going to have your board game friends. Uh, yeah, but a, even if you did grow up together, there's a chance that this whole time Sean's been actually really interested in finding that fantasy game that actually scratches his itch. That, that gives them the joy that a sci-fi game does. I'm making this up off my top of my head, but just as something that kindly diverts from what I know of, Sean, maybe there's something like that. Like, to be honest, I didn't know he was that into superhero games. I know I know. back in the day he was part of a comic book club at the local library and like supers, but like we never played Marvel together and that was one of my main systems. So who was I going to know that he's going <laughs> to end up collecting supers RPGs and running them online? To be fair, I prefer uh, original characters to... to canon characters which there, is you the reason. there you go and there's, there's DC and the marvel have never really uh you know yeah as much yeah, as you both I, love, I love reading those i love reading marvel and ca characters but i don't want to yeah. play them yeah there you go but like i said just just talk to your group right you never know what you can learn about other people by just asking people i don't know what it is what what in our you know lizard brain wiring makes us want to avoid those it's not like it's conflict you're just asking questions getting to know each other um maybe sit down and like do a quiz like hey everyone list a game they've always wanted to play right and then go around the table hey do it anonymously if you're I think someone's I, I don't know why you would judge someone based <laughs> on the games but like if that's your problem is you don't want to get your opinions out there but like check your existing group make sure people don't want to play those games and i gotta say if you're gaming with friends most of your friends are probably going to be willing to give it a shot just because you're interested in it and if that's not the case, maybe you need to do a, you know, quid pro quo, like, right? 
hey, you know what? This week we're going to play this. This week we're going to play this. This week we're going to play this. And I got to say, doing that, like if you've got a group of five gamers that all like five different types of games and you still want a game together and you're willing to try more, maybe like you play what are pirate games because that's what this guy likes and then you play RPGs and then you play a dungeon crawl and then you play heavy 4X and then you play party games the next week and you rotate it every time you get together. Yep, no, absolutely. There's definitely ways that you can work with your group to come to compromises. Yeah, and I got to say, especially with these meeting games, um, maybe just get agreed to play it once and now and then, right? At least get some use of it. Hey, I know you guys prefer these kind of games, but you know, if we get together once, one, once a quarter, once a year to at least sit down and play something meaty, I realize that doesn't really work with like campaign games, but like big 4X games, it could. And the other option is, maybe there's a chance outside your group to get this yeah. game played. Yeah, that is definitely another thought is find other gamers who into that kind of game. And here's where there's lots of resources, right? Maybe you, maybe you find a new group, maybe you find new friends, and maybe it's just like a bonus game night that you play a different type of game with those people. Uh, whether this is heavy games or light games, right? If you're constantly in a group that's playing mid heavy euros and you want to play party games, check meetup. And, and games that like Tim Hortons and coffee shops, they tend to any of those I've went out to expecting to bring hobby games tend to be people playing stuff like um, uh, what's the word? Guess who is always really popular at those events and Uno and stuff like that. So they're out there again, both sides, right? Uh, if you don't have the people in your group to game with, maybe I'm not saying it's time for a new group. No, like, no, this isn't. This you is can have not more than the one RPG. Group. <laughs> yes, you can have more than one game group. This is a thing. And the other thing is maybe some people in your group do like those games, right? If you're gaming with six different people, maybe two of those six are into the heavy games and they'll also play them with you, but three don't. Then maybe you, what you do is you set up a special event instead of like, say you get together every Monday. Well, once a month on Friday, just the four of you get together to play heavy games. Absolutely. And, you know, within your group party, without your, uh, you know, outside of your party, there's tons of ways. One of the greatest resources, and this goes for, for any size city. Uh, you know, it's, it's easier in a big city. You've got your FLGS. Sometimes they have bulletin boards. They have open gaming nights. Yeah. You can meet people. But in smaller cities, you can run into some trouble. But even if you're in a smaller city, Board Game Geek has regional mm -hmm. lists. Go into Board Game Geek, find your country, find your state, find your city if possible, or your county or whatever. Yep. And there are probably some local gamers that you have no idea exist. Yeah right around you and you know these people you can if they're on board game geek you can probably look at their geek lists or at their you know at their own list and go oh wow this person's got you know every edition of ti i can yep. play that or this person you know has got 15 different versions of uno that's awesome um or concerning i'm not sure but one of the two yeah, it was because in general <laughs> the thing with board game geek is you're probably going to find the hobby gamers right if you're looking for heavy gamers this, this is a place to look if you're looking for a casual party game night bgg may not be the best that's why i'm saying facebook meetup local game stores um game cafes right game cafes are, are popping up all over the place i know a lot didn't make it through covid but hopefully some more will come back in go and look for who's playing what now, make sure you're in obtrusives about this, but if you see someone playing those heavier games, ask like, hey, do you, are you part of a game group? Do you meet regularly? Do you want to meet up here to play this next week? Um, you know, do you know anywhere where people gather to play this game? Um, again, you go to most of those places. I know we're, we're as hobby gamers, we're always like, oh, a board game cafe, it'll be awesome. And you go in and again, it's everyone's playing Jenga and apples to apples. And you're like, but there's good games on the shelf. But you're going to find a mix of people and it's a good place to kind of uh, you know, hook up, I guess, with new gamers. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, there's there's so many different ways. Uh, pick your social media. I mean, type in hashtag board games on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, you know, look in your region. Well, on hashtag Facebook. board games is going to give you a bit much. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, read your check your region on Facebook. Check your region on Board Game Geek. Check uh, Meetup. Check mm -hmm. oh, all, uh, you know, there's there's just Tons. Tons of stuff. Hit the light up your library. Wander around your yes. library. There, there could be uh, a lot of libraries will have, uh, you know, a posting board where you can put up maybe, you know, hey, looking for a group that wants to play, you know, Uno, you know, whatever. Um, Actually, a know. lot of libraries nowadays have board game collections. Yep. Not as much RPGs. You can usually get D&D &D books, but 
I, you could stalk the library and look for people taking these out. But what I would do is just ask a librarian or a clerk, depending on who's working there, saying, hey, like, do you have a regular meetup? Do people come out? Is there a way for people who are taking these games out to hook up with each other to play them? And if they don't have something, maybe they'll be like, hey, that's not a bad idea. We'll just, you know, throw a sign up form here for people who want to get together and play games. Why bright to play Uno? Ah. Uh <laughs> Or whatever, right? It could yeah, be yeah. to play Uno. I, I think you'd probably be able to find people to play Uno pretty easily, but... Yep. Um, um, there's other places too, right? Like uh, local legions. Or yep. there, there are more gaming communities out there than you would think, I would have to say. Especially when you get into casual games. Oh, that's fair. Uh, and, well, in our chat room, Brian brings up an interesting one where... It's not necessarily games as much as trying to find people who want all those new expansions, right? Sometimes you've got a game, uh, you know, and I think like, I'm going to go back to Race for the Galaxy again. You've got Race for the Galaxy and you love it and, and you're you're good at it. And then someone else goes, oh, but I've got these 17 expansions. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, no, but I, I like the game. I don't really want to learn 17 new expansions. Uh, that's a lot of work. And, and, I, and I think the game is really, really nicely balanced right like this. So thanks, but no thanks. I'm just going to keep playing in my way or Ascension or, you know, you know, all these all these various games where people want to, you know, jam well, all these expansions onto. Uh, look at look at the one we're talking to about tonight. Side, there's like five, like significant content expansions for that mm -hmm. game. And I got to say, Ryan, I feel your pain. Uh, my biggest problem is, it, again, pre-COVID. Now I do play with the same people all the time. I played a lot in public spaces, so I was always playing with new people. And in general, expansions are complicated compared to base rules. And I spent way too many times playing games with just the base rules because someone was new at the table. And honestly, again, the only solution I ever found was make an event, right? Make the event game. Like, yeah, we're showing up to, to CG Realm this weekend to play this game, but we only want experienced players. Think of it like when you read a con book, right? And it tells you you need it, whether you need to know the rules, show up with the character or not, that kind of thing. You kind of have to do. So that's a totally a related but different question than what Andrew asked. Andrew's talking about his specific group, but that is another way to get games played is to schedule events publicly. So like go to your local game store, whatever, Tim Hortons, whatever it happens to be. So once once you found those groups, those meetups, the Facebook group, the board game geek section, do some kind of sign up, find a public place to play, meet up and play your games. And really, like we've got previous episodes about founding a gaming club and running games in public and check all those out for the details of how to do that stuff, because that is a big step. That's a step above just finding new players. It's setting up a club, look for an existing one is my general recommendation <laughs> before trying to make your own. But if there isn't one there, that is an option. Now, another option, and this is another one that we've got episodes on, is play online. Yeah. There's a lot of places, and now you're not going to be able to find all the games you want online, but there's a lot of games out there that have huge online communities. Uh, and this doesn't have to be a BGA or a tabletop uh, simulator it could just be a, you know, I set up my chessboard, you set up your chessboard and we play over Zoom mm -hmm. or, you know, play by post. There's a lot of different options out there, depending on the kinds of games you're looking for uh, and locations where there are going to be already going to be other people looking yeah. to play those games. So I got to say, there's going to be very few games that are popular enough you can find players for that you're not going to find a way to play online. May not be supported by the publisher or may uh, tabletop simulator is a good example of being able to play almost anything that's out there in one way or another on that on that particular platform but yeah board game arena is a fantastic way as long as one person in your group has a subscription i can't say subscription a subscription you can invite anyone to play with a free account for now we'll see if asmodee ever changes that but so far that still stands and that is a great way to get these big games played now that does not assuage you of the guilt of having bought a big massive thing but at least you get to have the experience of playing the game plus there's digital versions of games so again we're reviewing scythe later tonight well there's a steam version of scythe there's a steam version of pretty much every day's a wonder game many asmodee games direwolf digital all of their games you can play online that is a way to at least get enjoyment from a game without you know getting your game to the table now another option is maybe you're really wanting to play these kinds of games that you can't get to the table, but they aren't right for you. 
and maybe you're getting maybe maybe you you know you really want that super mini game from from kickstarter and maybe you do get it and maybe you even have the people to get it on the table but you're not enjoying it or you know it's just it's not it, these games aren't hitting the uh, the spot for you uh one way to start helping with this disconnect could be clean up your collection you know maybe yeah. you've been trying and and really focusing in on a certain kind of game that just is turning out not to be right for you and your group not just you uh and so maybe do a cleanup you know settle into a smaller gaming collection of games that do get played uh and and having that smaller collection and and not thinking oh i can get another one of these uh because you don't have any of them already you know it helps uh, helps sort of fend off some of those urges and needs and and cravings you're getting for games when you look around and you go oh look at all these games i've gotten i play them all all the time that's great if i get that is it going to get played well we got rid of like seven of those so probably not um, and that may help you uh, ease away from some of the the disconnect by un under helping understand yourself what you and your groups are going to be happy to play. Yeah, I know. I know a couple friends that purge like that, that have like I only have X games in my collection. One is 14. They have 14 games in their collection. And that's it. That's all they will ever have at a time. And I guess say they feel pretty good. Like they don't have much guilt at all. And their big question is always. If I'm going to buy this, what am I going to get rid of? And many times that alone stops them from getting or even and here's the important part, wanting anything else because they sit there and go, well, here's the four game games I'm enjoying. Yeah, that Kickstarter is cool, but is it better than any of those? And they're like, yeah, possibly not. Yeah, I mean, you have to think about what's actually getting played. Uh, you know, it, it's really easy to look at shelfies on the well, on the internet and go oh it would be so great to have the wall of games but odds are good that most people who are taking these giant shelfies haven't played most of those games in a very long time yeah. uh, a lot of them they're they're either publishers and or they're they're designers you know they get they, every time they design a game they get a copy of their game and it goes on the shelf or, you know, and plus, you know, all their friends games or they work for a publisher and they get one of all the games and or they're a reviewer and they get, you know, one of all the games to review. Um, don't, uh, you know, fear of missing out, especially on things like shelfies can really uh, be an unhealthy driver. Yeah. Um, you know, you may want all these games, but again, why do you want these games? Do you want to play them or do you just want to be able to be that cool guy who's got a thousand games? <laughs> uh so there's, there's yeah, how much something. is retail therapy as well well absolutely uh right that, but that goes back into we were talking about the fear marketing you know, the marketing exclusives and that why you buy them um i i think overall the big thing is for one ensure the people you're with don't want to play the games don't just assume that your gaming group is like no won't ever play that have the conversation, find out if people are interested in exploring new things, trying out new games, show them the Kickstarter, show, play the video, go, doesn't this look awesome? And if they're like, nah, then you're like, okay, maybe not, but maybe you get some buy-in. And again, if it's part of the group, maybe you set up a special game night or you just play it with them. I know there's this, like they call them the geek social fallacies, right? You've got your game group. It's the six of us. It's the six of us every week. And if you play on a different night without someone, they'll feel left out. Okay. That's the put on the big boy pants, grow up. Sorry, big boys, private big person pants, grow up. And, and like that silly thoughts, like it doesn't make sense. This is games. It's about having fun. If you are going to have more fun playing this game with those four people and these other games with these six, then you split into two groups. It's not a hard thing to do. Maybe not the easiest conversation, but it probably needs to happen if you're at that point. Yeah, definitely. Definitely think about the the fallacies that may be coming into play and the the group dynamics that may mm -hmm. be coming into play. And, and, and just take a good long think about what is stopping you from playing and why yeah. it's stopping you from playing, um, because by wanting to buy those games may not be the problem. <laughs> right there's there's you know it's it's there could be very different uh, varying other problems that has nothing to do with the fact that you want the game and your group doesn't play them yeah. um you you could be looking at it wrong possible now if that doesn't work you, your group doesn't want to be into those games and i'm not saying you should question hanging out with them i have to assume that you also enjoy playing the games they like to play or you wouldn't be hanging out with them see 
comments a couple seconds ago if that's not the case um find people who do like the games like whether that's at a game store or it's online or it's you put a posting in the library we talked about lots of different ways to do it find a way to play the games um possibly like i said online um meeting people meetups all those different things try to find people who are into them um do not force your group here's something we probably should have mentioned earlier like we kind of talked about converting your group you don't you, you can be i'm trying to think of the terminology you can be an uh, a, a advocate for a game but don't be an evangelist like like yeah you're not you don't want to convert games. right Bring up suggestions, see if people are willing to try new things, but if they say no, you have to accept that. No, you, you are not trying to convert people. And again, Sean was talking about war gamers looking down on board gamers. Don't do that. The, the games you play do not make you a better or worse person than anyone else. I know I think we've said that on the show, but I just want to imply it. Make sure that's out there again, that we weren't trying to to say that the people who like meteor games are better than the people who like to play Uno. It's all games, it's all fun. That's the whole point of the entire thing. If a game is stressing you out, you probably should avoid that right like if, if you get stressed out over this you probably should take a look at it right like why are you getting stressed out over this it's supposed to be fun it's supposed to be a hobby if you relieve that stress by finding people play with great maybe you just stick to the light games i don't know that, that's going to be up to you to decide not something we can tell you about and neither of us are psychologists lawyers or doctors <laughs> absolutely again it's it's all about having fun right yeah. that's the whole reason this hobby exists is to have fun playing games. Um, and while, yes, there are competitive aspects to it, um, that's not what we're really here to, and, and that's not what we're talking about. If you want to enter tournaments, you can absolutely find people who will play your games. That's Heck, a whole... there's that too. That's, that's a <laughs> uh, whole thing we kind of didn't mention. But if you're talking about the hobby side of things and not the competitive tournament side of things, uh, keep it fun. Keep it enjoyable. Yeah. That's what we're here to do all right so i think that's it for our discussion on the disconnect between games you want and games that will actually get played and how to resolve that problem if that is in fact a problem <laughs> <laughs> remember we're here to answer your gaming game night questions you got a question for us head to the website click on ask the bellhop fire off an email questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media Hello and welcome to our long anticipated review of Scythe from Stonemeyer Games. So this is a game that our fans have been asking me to give a second shot for a long time. And thanks to Jamie at Stonemeyer Games, who offered us a review copy, we're finally able to give it a second try. Now Scythe was designed by Jamie Stegmeyer, features some awesome and evocative artwork from Jacob Wolzowski. Graphic design by Christine Santana and a solo, solo, solo mode. I don't even know what I was trying to say. Solo mode from Morton Monrad Penderson. Pederson. I should almost just start over. I'm botching all the names tonight. Sorry about that, all of you. Uh, Scythe was originally published in 2016 by Jamie's own company, Stonemeyer Games, and has pretty much been a hit since then. Scythe, with just the base game, plays one to five players, with games taking an hour or two, depending on the player count, with your first couple games taking significantly longer. If by chance like us, you already don't like Scythe for one reason or another, either from a poor experience in person or the bizarre way of teaching that I found they had in the digital app, I urge you to listen in and maybe give it another chance. Now, I'm pretty sure Scythe is an evergreen product by Stonemeyer at this point. Uh, it's very much still in print and can usually be picked up for less than the MSRP, which is 124 Canadian or 99 US. For example, right now, you can go to Stonemeyer's website and get it for 99 Canadian or 85 US. Now, there are many varied expansions for this game, but tonight we are only talking about and looking at the base box, the core box, if you will. Okay, so what is Scythe? Is it a war game, mech battle, skirmish? It's not immediately obvious, I must say. So I gotta say, those three do really focus on combat, and that is definitely not what Scythe is all about. In Scythe, you take on the role of the leader of one of the five factions in Europe in a 1920s that never was. A war-torn land of farmers and fields, monuments, and mecha. 
This is a diesel punk battlefield where you're vying for dominance of the land surrounding the factory. Now, gameplay is actually an asymmetric mix of worker placement, area control, engine building, and exploration, with players only taking one or two actions each turn, lending to a quick turnaround and faster than expected gameplay. In the end, though, it's the faction with the most money that wins the game, with coin earned for accomplishing goals, area control, and resource buildup, as well as the value being affected by your faction's popularity at the end of the game. This is a medium to heavy Euro game with a very low random factor and a pretty steep learning mm -hmm. curve where each individual action is simple enough to learn. But figuring out how they all interact and work together is going to take more than just a couple of plays. Yes. Now, with that overview, let's talk a little bit about component quality starting by pointing everyone to our Scythe unboxing video on YouTube. Through that, you can see Mo take apart the box bit by bit and show off the excellent component quality you get in this game. So Scythe has a lot of moving parts in it, a lot of things going on, and that's actually also reflected in its components. You get character models and mechas and plastic. You get wooden meeples, each of which has a unique design for each of the five factions. You get a rather large hex filled board with places to put many of the game's cards and to track things like power and popularity. OK, so the board is noteworthy because it's two sided with the second side featuring a much larger hex. To use this side of the board, though, you do need the scythe board extension which is sold separately, and we haven't tried. I gotta say, as it is, it's already a big board, so you're gonna need a pretty big table if you do get that expansion. Now, you get wooden resources in four types, all denoted both by color and shape, which is a nice touch. Wooden buildings for each faction, star tokens, and other wooden tracking markers. Along with this are a few deck of cards, some tiles. These include faction abilities, combat cards, personal goals, encounter cards, reference cards, and cards for playing solo. The game also comes with some cardboard punch boards for money, encounter tokens, power dials, structure bonus tiles, and probably something else I'm forgetting. Again, there's lots of stuff. As you can see in the unboxing, you get a ton of stuff in this box, which honestly does help justify the rather high price point on this game. The quality on all these components is pretty much top notch. Yeah. with extra thought given to the component types. For example, it matters in the game if a unit is made of wood or plastic. Mm -hmm. An easy way to tell what abilities work with what units and what units can produce resources and what units can take part in battle. Nice. Now, our only complaint about any of this is the fact is that the board is quite dull and it can be hard to tell the various hex regions apart. While they're all distinguished by color, artwork, and iconography, it might have been better if there was more contrast or the icons were bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the wood and metal icons, oddly enough, are a little too similar. Yeah, especially based on the size. Like, I kind of wish I get that this game's about the artwork and the evocative feel, but I almost would have preferred if the hexes were just giant icons that showed me what they produce and started trying to give me a look of an actual landscape with mountains and villages on it. And I, I just feel the compromise, like maybe make those icons take up half the hex. I don't know. So it's, it's the one improvement, I would say. Now, before we move on, I also think it's worth noting that Stonemire offers a wide variety of ways to upgrade these components. Uh, the most famous and most popular are the metal coins, but you can also get realistic looking resources as well to replace the wooden ones. In addition to official upgrades, Etsy and similar sites are filled mm -hmm. with a wide variety of side upgrades and inserts. Now, speaking of inserts, the box itself or side, the insert it comes with works rather well. Uh, it's mainly designed to keep the miniatures and plastic components from getting damaged or bent. Now, the weird thing is the game came with two really well-designed plastic resource trays, which is great. But it's odd there's two of them because there are four resource types in the games as well as other counters that I would like in those type of containers. Now, oddly, if you back the Kickstarter, I guess you got four. So I don't know. There was some compromise there to give us two of them. Whatever it is. Um, I do have to say, though, at this point, just owning the base game, I don't feel any need to look for a third party box insert, though, based on the number of expansions are out there and how tight my box already fits. 
That may change if I ever pick up some expansions. All right. Well, I think that's about enough. What you uh, enough about what you get when you pick up something. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to an overview of play. Now, this overview is not meant to be a full gameplay teach. Scythe is a meaty game with a weight approaching four on Board Game Geek. So what we're going to do, try and do is give you an idea, just a rough overview of how the game plays so you can judge if it sounds like something your group might enjoy. For a look at the setup and full gameplay of Scythe, we both recommend you check out Rodney Smith's Scythe How to Play video on YouTube. Now, for all the stuff you get in the box, I gotta say Scythe is pretty quick to set up and get going. You lay out the board, each player gets a faction assigned randomly and takes the appropriate faction mat and all the components for that faction. They then sit so they can reach the faction's home base on the board. Each player then gets a random player mat, which they pair with their faction, and that's kind of your playing area. Now, the rules as written say to do this randomly. But since Scythe has been out, many people have played it and reported problems with certain combinations. Jamie, the designer of the game, has published a list of banned combinations. These are Crimea Patriotic and Rusviet Industria. Jamie says that if you draw either of these combinations, you should return your player mat to the pool and draw another. Something I would not worry about for your first couple plays, but once you actually have figured out the intricacies of Scythe, you probably want to pay attention to that. I guess those two combinations, you can win the game way quicker than expected. You can get your stars out a little too quick. More about that later. Next, players are going to set up their boards with all their components, which honestly is pretty easy to do because the boards are nice and two-layered, and it's pretty easy to see what goes where. On the main board, like uh, the main board, not your personal board, the, everyone is going to mark their starting popularity and power, and everyone will place their character on their faction's base with two workers in the hexes adjacent to that base. Honestly, even if you haven't played before, you're probably going to be able to get most of your components in the right place, so you've got about a 50-50 chance of getting your cubes in the wrong place. Yes. Now, a game of Scythe has no set round limit. The game is played until one player is able to place their sixth star on the board. The game ends immediately when this happens, to some player's chagrin. Stars are earned for a wide array of reasons, which we'll get into in a bit. You just need to know if the game ends after six stars are placed. And this is actually a very big deal. It allows you as a player to control the game in a way that's somewhat unique, deciding whether or not you want to rush to the end when you see an opportunity or try to draw it out as long as you can to perhaps recover from mm -hmm. some earlier mistakes. Now, each turn inside, you're going to move your action token to one of the four regions on your player board. You're then going to get the chance to do the action list at the top of your board in that region, followed by the action at the bottom of the board. Now, there are four different top actions and four different bottom actions, and every player board features these in a unique combination, one of the first asymmetric aspects of the game. In general, top actions get you stuff and let you do stuff on the map, whereas the bottom actions let you build things and put new things in play. But that's just a generalization. Now, here's where things are going to have to stay pretty high level, or else this will become a two-hour review. <laughs> Each action lists a cost and what you get for that cost in the form of one or more benefits. Some of these costs and benefits start the game covered up, and by taking certain actions, you'll move things from one place to another, or out onto the map, and this will therefore change the cost or improve future benefits. Yep. Similarly, building mechs will unlock faction-specific abilities. Again, when you move a mech off, there's something underneath them. Yep. So all of this makes way more sense when you see it right in <laughs> front of you. The fact is, you need to play the game and experiment. There is no way to completely teach it. Well, hopefully this will make a little more sense when I explain what the actions are. I'm going to start with the top actions. So one of the first top actions is trade. Spend a coin to gain resources or popularity. If you built your armory, you can also gain some power. Resources are needed to take the bottom actions and actually build things as well as being worth money at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. Popularity is a big part of the game. Scoring and power is used during battles. An interesting twist inside is that any resources you collect are actually placed on the board, on the map. Mm -hmm. You need a unit with them to spend them, 
and you're going to want to protect your resources from other players. Now, produce is another way to gain resources and is based on where your workers are on the map, with each of the different types of hexes producing different resources. And one of we mentioned the four resources, well, there's also cities. Cities produce more workers. Now, the cost for this goes up the more workers you have in play. If you get all your workers out in play, you earn one of those valuable stars. You start by being only able to produce in two hexes in action. But that can be improved, and building a mill can generate you resources without a worker. A bolster is a way to improve your power or gain combat cards, both needed if you plan on getting in a fight. You can also gain popularity if you built your monument. You earn a star if you hit the top of the power track and or the top of the popularity track, gaining two if you get to the top of both. Now, combats happen during movement and are always one player versus another. Players spend power and can add in combat cards based on how many plastic units are in a fight. The only random factor here is what combat cards players have, which vary in value from two to five, with twos being more common. Now, you earn a star for the first two combats you win, which is interesting, as after that, there's no real incentive to get in a fight. Now, movement is the final top action and lets you move two units each one hex. The ability to move more units can be unlocked, as can the ability to move further and the ability to move through tunnels, which connect various different areas of the map, making them adjacent to each other. If when moving, your character lands on a spot with an exploration token, they have to stop, you draw the top card from the deck and resolve it. These are actually a lot of fun and give you three options, usually something small and free, something with a bit of a cost that's usually worth it, and something absolutely horrible you can do to the people of the land that gives you something awesome, but for a big popularity hit. Now, there are a number of movement restrictions in place at the beginning of the game, including rivers on the map, uh, moving into controlled areas, and more. Each faction has its own way to cross the rivers that has to be unlocked by building the right mech. Now, some factions also have units that can swim, and the factory offers another way to move. Now, that's it for the top actions. So those are your four choices. Every turn, you're going to pick from one of those four. Now, moving on to the bottom actions, we have upgrade. This costs oil and lets you move a cube on your player board from the top action to a bottom action. What that does is it makes the top action more effective and it makes the bottom action you choose cheaper. Now note, you don't have to move a cube from the same area on top to the same area on bottom. Right. You can pick any combination of bottom and top action to improve. If you manage to move all of your upgrade cubes, you earn a star. Now deploy is how you get mechs on the board. Each faction has four mechs they can build and building each unlocks faction specific powers. Mechs cost metal to build and are your main combat units, but are also great for transporting farmers and resources. Mm -hmm. If you manage to build all four of your mechs, you earn a star. The build action costs wood and lets you build one of your four buildings. There is one of these in each action spot on your player board. Monuments earn you popularity, mill produces resources, the mine lets you travel through the tunnels, and the armory gives you power. In addition to this, buildings give you control of an area, which can be an important for resource management and end game scoring. Plus, if you build all of your buildings, you earn a star. Star Salad. There you go. Scythe is a star salad game. Now, the final bottom action is in list, and honestly, this is the most confusing one in the game. This lets you take a recruit token from your player board and put it on your faction board. This does two things. First, you get an instant reward based on what you cover up. Then for the rest of the game, you get a bonus whenever you or your opponents to your left and right take the action the recruit came from. Plus, you can earn a star for placing all of your recruits on the faction board. Now, along with these actions, there is a way to unlock a fifth option. If you successfully move your character into the factory that's the middle of the board, you get to pick a factory card. This gives you a new action with a spot, a uh, new action spot to choose with a really powerful top action, generally better than anything else in the game so far, and a bottom action that is a new move action that lets you move only one unit, but twice in a row. Now, having a second way to move can be a huge thing mm -hmm. in this game. In addition to this, the factory counts as three territories when scoring area control 
at the end of the game, which is a giant deal. Yes. Now, one thing you can do on your turn besides just taking your actions is complete a private objective. You get two of these at the start of the game, and if you fulfill the requirements at the end of your turn, you can turn it in or a star. Second card is then discarded. You can only do one of your two private objectives. So as a reminder, here are all the things you can do to earn a star. Complete all six upgrades. Deploy all of your mechs. Build all of your structures. Enlist all of your recruits. Have all of your workers on the board. Complete a private objective. Win up to two combats. Hit maximum popularity. And hit maximum power. Now remember, the game ends when you achieve six. There are ten different ways to do this. You can't do them all. Now once anyone earns that six star, the game ends. You enter a final scoring round. Note, the player doesn't have to even get to finish their turn when this happens. But you do finish whatever action it is you're doing that earns you that star. No one else gets in a final turn. You don't go around the board. You don't go to the start player or anything like that. The game just ends. This can be a shock to new players and possibly infuriating to even experienced players but it is part of the strategy this is the one aspect of the game my wife will probably continue to hate anytime we play now remember how at the start of this i said the only thing that matters is money well you take all the coins you earn during the game you then add that to some bonus coins now the main place these come from are three categories the amount of bonus coins is actually determined by how high up you are on the popularity track, with more points being earned for the higher up you are. The first bonus is for every star you placed. You multiply your total stars by the bonus amount and take that much money. So all of these are going to be multiplied by the bonus amount. The second is for every territory you control. Note, this includes any territory with your farmers or your units in them, as well as spot hexes with your buildings but no opponents units and don't forget that factories were three finally you're going to add up how many resources you control on the board remember you have to control the hex with the resources to count them unguarded resources aren't worth anything and you get cash for every two resources you have gathered now, there's one last way to get a few bonus bucks. You're going to get some kind of bonus coins based on where you built your four buildings during the game, if you built your four buildings. Uh, this part's interesting because it's randomly determined at the start of the game what you get it for. And there's things like building in a straight line, building near the tunnels, and so forth. The player with the most wealth wins, with $75 being considered a good score. And then from the designer, he says, if you're getting over 100 reg regularly, you're probably playing something wrong. So that's worth noting once you do sit down to play a game aside. Now, one thing we didn't get into at all is that this is a very asymmetric game and each faction and each player board is unique. They give you different amounts of starting power, popularity, money, and combat cards. The cost and rewards for taking bottom actions actually vary by each player board, each rewarding a different style of play. And also, while we did mention it earlier, the player boards have different combinations of top and bottom actions. Mm -hmm. And that can really, really change your strategy. Then there's the fact that every faction is unique with its own game-breaking abilities, yep. some of which are unlocked right from the start, and others that you unlock by building mechs. Finally, I think it's also worth noting that the game comes with an achievement sheet that you can fill out after each game. This has a number of entries on it with things like win a game without building mechs, be the first to win with each faction, have six stars, but don't win, and so on. Now, I think that's a pretty fair overview of play. Now it's time to move on to our thoughts on Scythe. So we started this entire review today talking about how it was a long-awaited long review. Uh, the short background on that is that I played Scythe back when it was the new hotness, and it wasn't a great experience. I played two games with a group of hardcore cutthroat gamers who had played the game many times before I showed up. This was a game with many gotcha moments. Ha ha ha, you made the classic mistake on focusing on your personal goals. Oh, you forgot the factory I took from you in the last turn was worth three? Ha 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 ha. It wasn't quite that bad, but you know what? That's the impression I was left with after getting totally stomped mainly to just 
not knowing the game well enough to play well and be competitive. Now, Mo has mentioned this a number of times on our show, and pretty much every time someone, someone in the chat, one of our Patreon patrons, someone in our Discord, or just some random gamer on Twitter would call out that he should give it another shot. Yeah, it's true. I've had many people try to convert me over to Scythe, and in general, I wasn't willing to give it another shot. I definitely wasn't going to go out and spend 125 Canadian on a game I didn't enjoy on my first play just to try it again. Now, I will say here, if it wasn't for COVID, I probably would have tried it again somewhere. I've had people offer to bring copies to cons so we could sit down and play together. I'm sure I could have got in to play at an Enter Life event or at the CG Realm might have had a demo copy or something. But as it stood, it wasn't until Jamie offered us up a review copy that I finally did give it another go at. And in doing so, figured out exactly what went wrong in that first play. There's far too much going on in Scythe for anyone to fully grok it after just one or two plays. The problem with my first experience wasn't really Scythe's fault or even the cutthroat players I was playing with. It was the, the, the perfect storm of both. No one should be tossed headfirst into a shark tank of experienced players for the first game of Scythe. This is a game that's best learned by experience and playing around, not trying to tread water and figure out how to swim. Even Jamie himself, the designer of the game, recognizes this and addresses it in the rulebook by encouraging exploration during your first mm -hmm. few plays. The reference card even has some recommended first actions that include things like take a top action no one else has taken just to see what it does. See, that's what I missed out on. I miss getting to discover and explore the game. That's what changed when I got my own copy and presented it to my regular gaming group. Our first game of Scythe was extremely casual, and we just had fun with it. We followed those recommended actions. We literally went down the line. Oh, take an action no one else has taken. Well, how about you take that? Well, no one's done this yet. Why don't we try that? And I got to say, it was probably the longest game of Scythe played any, ever by any group but it was a game that let all four of us slowly figure things out on our own. And it was after that first game that I started to see the appeal of Scythe. This is the entire thing with Scythe. There is a lot going on. Mm. The actual actions in the game are simple enough to learn. The whole top and bottom action thing is very well done and pretty cool in play. And the asymmetric nature if the game, of the game is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But you can't possibly see how it all works together until you've sat down and played it a few times. Yeah, I agree completely. It wasn't until that overly long exploration game I started to see how the player boards work differently. I've got to admit, those first plays, I didn't even realize that each one emphasized a different style of play. Heck, I didn't even notice that my bottom actions were different from someone else or the fact that they had different costs. Like if he built a mech, he gets a buck. If I build a mech, I get three or it only cost him two wood to build buildings. I actually just thought that they mixed up what was paired. I didn't realize there was more to it than that. And that's not to mention all the stuff I discovered while playing, like why you may want to do one thing or another, or how important it is to protect your resources. Cause I got to say, I missed that the first game. And there was that, ha ha ha, you left these sitting here moment, or the fact you can go an entire game without a single combat and it still works. This is important to note. Despite having a map and units on it, Scythe is not a folk on a map war game. Oh. Uh, and I think uh, one of the big things is the, the appearance of mechs is mm -hmm. one of those things that, that pushes people towards it being that combat yes, war game. I agree. While combat can be part of the game, it's very much not the focus. No. As we mentioned earlier, the biggest incentive to combat is earning those first two stars. And after that, it's just not usually worth the cost or risk unless someone happens to leave a big juicy stack of resources just sitting there. Yeah, there, there are, are sometimes other reasons, but really it's not. And you know what? They tried to get it across on the cover by showing like half battle and half farms. And I think that people focus on the mechs without realizing the brightest part of the box is people gathering resources, which so there were definitely hints there. Now, something we did skip over during the rule summary is that whenever you attack a territory with farmers, you lose popularity for each one that runs away. And I've got to say, this is another thing that really deters combat, right? Because this can be a huge deterrent because popularity can be a massive hit to your score. 
Now, if everyone's around the same area, sure. And I, I totally want to play the game where everyone plays low popularity, but it hasn't happened. As long as someone starts trying to get up there on the popularity track, the rest of the group probably has to follow to be competitive. This game is much more about planning your actions and making sure you have the resources on hand to maximize your turns, mm -hmm. taking advantage of both the top and the bottom actions on your board as often as possible. Mm -hmm. It's also about figuring out what your board and faction are good at and mm -hmm. leaning into that as well as taking advantage, advantage of your faction's unique abilities. And then, of course, there's a game mastery of once you figured out your faction's advantages, what are your opponents and what are they going to try to do? And this is why I try to say that like, this is not a, a quick to learn, easy to play. You're going to get it right away game. Like even the fact that each faction has a different version of the Riverwalk ability greatly impacts what parts of the board players are going to have access to and how quickly they can expand. Now, another big part of side is the order that you do things in. And whether you do them at all, which can greatly affect gameplays. Do you rush to get your mechs out or do you bother to build tunnels? Do you get all your recruits out early to take advantage of your neighbors taking bottom actions? Like I said, there's just a lot going on in this game. And actually, that's one icon that has been known to cause some confusion. That's the river walk. Yeah. Though, honestly, I'm not sure what else they could do without making it needlessly complex. It does. It has led to some confusion. Yes, it shows where you can move into, not where you can go back and forth from. It's about the best I can say for people who may be playing Scythe wrong. I'll admit we got it wrong. Now, some other highlights in Scythe include a very well-written rulebook, an excellent FAQ online. Uh, one, I admit, we didn't have to reference too often, but it was good. It was there for a couple edge cases. Uh, component quality, where we already talked about quite a bit. It's awesome. And I love the fact that that it matters what's plastic and what's wood. It makes it so much easier to teach certain parts of the game. Like all of your mech abilities apply to your leader and your mech. It's a way easier to say, if a piece is plastic, it affects these. If a piece is wood, it it can produce resources. Like I love that. I dig that that's there. It's, it's good as a reminder and it's great for teaching the game. As we've noted, this is a fantastic tool in games and something Arnak as an example does well as also to help differentiate those components and different purposes. I also really appreciate the achievement sheet, uh, though I have to say we haven't filled ours out. We probably should have. We probably should have broke it out the first game, no matter if it was a learning game or not. Uh, but it was looking at that that had me discover more aspects of the game. Like the one that says you can't win without building mechs. And I looked at the board and I'm like, how, we, how can you do that? That means no river walk. How do I get to the center of the board? How would I even get off my peninsula? And then actually trying to play a game going, okay, this game, I'm not going to build any mechs. And I'm like, Oh, I'm an idiot. The tunnel. Why didn't I even think of that? Right. But like without reading that achievement, I made and never made that connection. And every game built mechs every time without realizing that it's even possible to win without them. And I, I really dig that sheet for kind of opening my eyes to new things. And we mentioned this in our making board games more like video games episode. It's just a great way to help players think outside the box mm -hmm. and consider other potential paths to victory. And I also like the combat system here. It's almost deterministic, right? It's it's almost whoever has the most power wins is, is kind of it. So there's a limit. Everyone can only spend a max of seven, which is kind of an interesting choice. So once you're all up there, you all have about the same power. And when you enter a fight, you know exactly how much power your opponents has. You know how many combat cards they have. And right there printed on the board is the distribution of those combat cards. You can play the odds in your head. Often you're going to know exactly how much power you need to spend, how much they need to spend. And even when it's a win, though, there's this bluffing back and forth like, yeah, I'm going to beat you. Are you going to spend seven so I have to spend eight just to deplete my resources? Or are you going to spend one and run away so I waste a bunch and trying to figure that out? Like, I really dig that back and forth. Also, the fun little wheel component, which hold, which also holds the cards, is just a nice touch, too. Yeah, it is. It works better than you would expect. Though you tell people, don't, you don't have to put the cards face down, because then you just got to flip them. Just don't let me see it ahead of time. Um, now, this bluffing does lead me to a part of Scythe we did not mention above. And this is something that I'll admit the groups I usually play with don't really tend to use this rule. I pointed out it exists, but it just doesn't tend to come up. Inside, you are allowed to negotiate and make deals and alliances. You can even trade coins. Remember, money is all that matters at the end of the game. So you're trading victory points. You can literally bribe other players to do things, make deals like I'm going to attack you and take all your, your wheat 
unless you give me six coins, that is a valid move in a game of side. Now, no, none of these contracts are binding. So you can't do that. I'm going to give you seven bucks to go attack her. And then they don't go attack her. Well, that might lead to some infighting. And there's where you get into the problems and potentials of games like diplomacy or risk. They're all present here. Now, I think most people listening know I'm not a big fan of these types of mechanics and games. So we mostly stayed away from them in our games. But I am sure some groups out there love this diplomatic aspect of side. This is potentially what might make the game less universal than some of it. Mm. The sheer variety of play styles could really make the game so startlingly different between different groups True. and group dynamics. A cutthroat, aggressive player could sit down at our table and be bored to tears with our play style. Yeah. No, I'm not taking your money. Nope, I'm not taking your money. It'd be like sitting down to play Catan with that player who never trades, right? They'd probably hate it. Meanwhile, other groups, I'm sure you'd sit down and be like, wait, what do you mean you're bribing him to do that? I'm like, it's legal by the rules. I have a feeling there's people out there that don't know that is by the book. Now, before we go on to some final thoughts, I do want to talk a bit about playing side solo. This is a game that plays one to five. Now, I am not someone you should consider a solo gamer, but in order to be fair and do a complete review, I did want to try the solo game. And I will admit I did it at the easiest difficulty just to give it a shot. Now, while I've played solo on Steam, I was playing against computer opponents, and that doesn't really quite count. So I do wonder, does the Steam have the Atama version to play? I, you know what? I, I didn't have time to check. Yeah, that. I just wonder if there, there was a way to do it. So anyway, we're talking about the physical game anyway, not the Steam version. If you want a Steam review, maybe we'll do that sometime. So Solo Play and Scythe uses a 19-card driven AI. As a player, you play exactly the same game. It, you literally play it the same as you play Scythe. But your opponent's actions are determined by the cards, and they ignore many of the core rules of the game. For example, they don't generate or use resources. They don't build buildings or have things like faction powers. Instead, they start with a character and two workers in play. The remaining max stars workers on their faction board. No player board needed. They don't take actions at all. Well, that's certainly better than trying to play multiple factions at once and all that would entail. Very true. Now, after each of your turns, you flip over the top Atoma card, which will tell you which enemy units move and how to move them, which uses a fairly complicated neighborhood system that I got to say is quite confusing and will take a bit to get used to. It was confusing enough that after my play, I went and watched a couple actual plays to see if I got it right. And I think I did in most cases, but I do know I put two workers on the same hex at least once. So I did mess it up a little bit. So it might be a bit rough for the player who just wants a game of Scythe and no one else is around, but for a more regular solo player, it should become pretty straightforward with play. Yeah, I agree. Now, this movement may trigger a combat. You do your part of the combat the same. You grab a combat wheel, decide how much power to spend, and add any applicable combat cards. For the AI, though, you flip another card from that deck and you look at this gauge on the side. This determines how much power they're willing to spend and how many combat cards they will use, if any. The winner gets a star as usual, with enemy units being retreated to the faction board, not their base. That is something I messed up in my play. When winning a fight or scaring away farmers, which is a part of the play, you get a random number of resources. Again, you're going to flip a card and look at the spot on it that shows the resources you get for a combat. Now, based on that last part, is combat more useful in the solo mm -hmm. game due to that you know resource bump from every combat? I Honestly, really, it's no different from the core game. Like, unless you're just trying to grab the factory or you're just doing a fight to win a star, most combat and scythe was over a spot filled with resources. Like, even if you're trying to get that star, you tried to attack somewhere where you're going to get something more out of it. What does seem odd is that it's random. Whereas if I'm playing the real game, I know the stakes going in. I know you're, I'm taking three oil and a, corn, and, and a food from you. Whereas here, I might get something, I might get nothing. Good to know. Now, after moving, the opponent gets stuff. Uh, this could be more units, money, power, combat cards. Next, the card shows recruit icons. This is tied into the whole recruit action we talked about before, where you're moving tubes off your thing and putting on your player board. And basically, it simulates that the, the AI took that action. So if you've unlocked that recruit, you get the reward if it's shown on the card. Now, finally, in the center of the card, there will or won't be a big star. If there's a star, you actually move a counter on a star track. Now, this isn't the star track on the board. There are, I think, four different star tracks included, which are the four different difficulty levels for the Atoma. Um, and the tracks are different. Now, as the counter moves up on this track, the AI 
Eventually you get some, I, I want to say water walk because they could cross all lakes and rivers. And then they start earning stars. And then about uh, two thirds of the way through, you're actually going to take all the Atoma cards and turn them 180 degrees and the AI becomes more aggressive. And this is the way the Atoma starts getting stars, but they can also still earn them by winning combats as well as hitting the top of the power track. Interesting timing system, but also a good way to parcel out the rewards to the AI. Yeah. Now, just like a normal game, solo play ends as soon as someone places their sixth star, whether it's you or the AI. Points are then calculated pretty much the same as normal. The, the AI doesn't actually build buildings or have resources, so won't get any points for those. Now, I wonder, how did your score compare to group play? It feels like scoring might be a little higher in solo. Uh, well... I did exceptionally well, which makes me wonder if I did anything else wrong. Um, I did watch some videos, and it seems like the only thing I actually mixed up mainly was I was in the AI's favor. When I was defeating units, I was putting them on the base. Meanwhile, they shouldn't have been coming back out until a card told me to put them out. But I had over 100 wealth, and the AI was in the 50s. I didn't quite double, but it was really close. Um, now, this was on the easiest Atoma, where many of the cards you just ignore and the AI doesn't take a turn. Maybe I've now played enough games aside them just that good. I don't know. Uh, but like I said, the movement system for the AI is quite involved, and I could have easily messed something up. And I, I do admit, I only tried it once. I did see some suggestion that the solo, solo, solo scores were higher, but it may actually just be the player skill and faction combination. Yeah. And I will admit, I took a faction that I did not take a popularity hit for attacking farmers. And I think that's extremely powerful versus the AI. And I use that to get the majority of my resources during my game. So I honestly do think that could have been part of it as well. Now, overall, playing solo, it was okay. Uh, again, I only gave it one shot. I know we said we like to try things five times, but I didn't do that for the solo play. Sorry, but at least I'm talking about it. I would much rather play a game with real opponents, but it's nice to have. It's a nice option. Um, it's simple enough overall, though, again, the movement rules are a little weird. Um, I suggest anyone trying to try it, watch a video or two, just to make sure you're getting it right. Um, I appreciate that there's an option to play solo, and I really dig that there's actually different difficulty levels, though I doubt I'll be trying them out myself. It's interesting to note that online you can find ways to play with more than one Atoma character, mm. though you do need a separate deck for each, and there are even rules for playing with a mix of multiple humans and Atoma. Now, not something we really tried or planned on trying, though it actually seems to be the preferred way to play solo in the BGG forums uh, against two-player, two Atoma. Uh, the preferred mm -hmm. method seems to be there's an app called Scythekick, uh, both available on both iOS and uh, Android, and that manages your Atoma for you and makes it a little easier on you. Sounds interesting. Again, I'll, I'll take humans. I'll play against humans. <laughs> All right, overall, Scythe to me is the perfect example of a board game that can't be judged based on only a couple of plays. This is a big meaty game that is best approached slowly and explored along with a group that's also new to the game. And I know that's not going to be able to happen for everyone. While each individual action and system in this game is easy to understand, seeing the big picture and how things interact is not. In this world of one and done games, Scythe almost fails. Obviously enough people liked it on their initial play that it grew to be as popular as it is. But I'm sure there are plenty of gamers out there that mm. gave up after their first play, as Mo almost did. True. Uh, yeah, this is a game not to be taken lightly. It's not going to be a game for people who aren't willing to sit down and learn the ins and outs of the game and develop some form of game mastery over multiple plays. Now, the thing is, though, if you're willing to put in that work, Scythe comes out as a fantastic game. It has a ton of depth, depth, near infinite. Uh, I, I screw up depth and now I can't talk. <laughs> it has a ton of depth, near infinite replayability due to the different faction combinations of objective cards and events, and a huge breadth of strategies and ways to play, all of which seem totally valid. Jamie himself said it well on Board Game Geek by saying, It is a game, not a puzzle. It cannot be solved. Nice. Yeah, personally, I'm very happy, all you fans, all you Bellhop fans, those of you in the lobby who convinced me to give Scythe another shot. 
I now finally understand how it's ranked in the top games in the world right now. I think I'm working you as number 16 last time I looked. It's official at this point. I am a side convert. You won me over. You got me. Well, that's it for our review of Scythe from Stonemeyer Games. If you enjoyed this review, please consider showing your support at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Now, what's a game that you weren't sold on at first, but that you grew to love over more plays? We'd love to hear about it in the comments. Now that we're done here, I do also invite you to check out my written review of Scythe over at tabletopbellhop.com. There I can get into a bit more detail about some of the mechanics and share some picks from our gameplays. Before we move, uh, that's, that's, I just completely botched that. <laughs> and now the Bellhop's <laughs> Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Four years in, professionals. I was distracted because Kevin Wilson has discovered Twice Upon a Time. Oh, that movie is amazing. He, he, he apparently believed that it was a fever dream from his childhood and only yeah. just now rediscovered it. I love that movie. <laughs> The best thing Lucas ever did. No, Star Wars is still really good. <laughs> All right. Except for a solo game aside. Um, I don't know. Do we have any more we want to talk about the solo? Uh, it's uh, it's to me, it's it, if you're a solo gamer, it's not gonna bother you. There was a lot to set up, it's a lot of components to set up on my own. I, I would set up the player board. There's a real reason why Scythe kick, and there are other apps out there as well, but there's a reason why they've gone to apps for this. Yeah, uh, the solo players but I, are clearly pushing that it is way easier to play this with an app helping to manage the Atoma. So I wonder what the app does. Like if it shows where they move on the map. Well, or apparently what? like, like uh, Scythe apparently even works and helps you if you are like playing multiplayers. I didn't get it. I, uh, I, so yeah, I didn't okay. download it and check, but apparently it's, it's useful even if you're not playing solo. Okay. So interesting. It's like Gloomhaven helper for Scythe um yeah it's just like it literally says it's like okay there's all these icons at the top of the card and you look at the first icon it'll be one type of move it'll be like move a worker or move towards a factory or it'll be move your character or it'll be combat move against a farmer or combat move against a unit and if you can't do the first one you go to the next one, you go to the next one then it's like okay eligible unit and almost always it's the one closest to the ai's base so that's pretty easy but if there's a tie you then pick it in reading order so you literally like left to right, top to bottom. And then it says, now find the eligible hexes it can go to. Well, the AI teleports. And there's a cute little story of why the AI can teleport because it's this, you know, diesel punk world. And it's like, so you literally then look at neighborhoods. Well, the neighborhood is you pick a hex and what's in the hex, the neighborhood is everything that's around that hex that can be reached, which at the beginning, because the rivers isn't everything and eventually it just becomes all eight around. So you're like, all right, so look at the neighborhoods. And then the tiebreakers will be like, find the neighborhood. Like when you're moving a worker, it's going to move to the neighborhood that is not in the neighborhood of a enemy unit and is surrounded by it is adjacent to the most friendly neighborhoods as possible. So when you're like looking around the board and you're like, because it can teleport. And you're like, all right, this has three units around it. So the farmer moves here and it literally just teleports. You just now it's there. And then the next one will be like for the for the the, the factory, it'll be like, OK, pick up your leader wherever it is. The eligible areas are going to be anywhere that has an encounter token or the factory. And then there's a tiebreaker to figure out which it goes to. And basically, there's a whole thing where the enemy character could go around and grab all the encounter tokens, which I thought was neat that the AI even did that. It doesn't do anything with them, but then they're gone. So you can't get them. And like it just it's that fiddly with this whole neighborhood thing and counting up and then in read order, everything's always in read order. And I am certain I messed that up somehow. The rest of it, simple. Then here's what they get. Then I get a thing if I have a thing. And then the star token moves up. The old man remembering to move that star, star token, that's the one thing I might have lost on. Like, like I don't think I would have lost the game. I think they might've hit six stars before I did if I'd done it properly. So I think I might've messed that up. I was I was actually digging around today on the board game geek forums about sc uh, scores when I was looking into yeah. you know what what scores were and yeah I and just saw the thing where Jamie's like if you're scoring over a hundred regularly you're playing wrong and I'm wondering like have we been playing wrong because I swear every game we play someone gets over a hundred yeah it's like I'm seeing like there are people who can score 168 which is I think like the maximum score um, but I, I you know I'm, I I question 
I question some of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends who you're playing against, right? I play well, against my kids and I do everything perfect. Maybe I can get that. <laughs> well, and also there is one thing I noticed. There was actually a complaint in the reviews for Scythekick complaining that it was enforcing the uh, combination ban. Oh, okay. So it, it wouldn't let you play the 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 risk via yeah. combinations and people are like well i shouldn't force that i'm like but the game designer said don't yeah, play that way consider them banned. <laughs> so they say uh, ignore it for the covers couple that needs to go in the rule book i i again there's a really good thread about it where jamie's like yeah you can win in 14 turns with those two factions where an average game should take 25 or something like that yeah. Like it, it, there was a comparison and both those two combos could actually win equally quick. And then one of the people on the threads, like, so the ultimate two player game is to play those combos <laughs> and then you get a nice rapid version of scythe. And I'm like, that's kind of brilliant actually. Could be. Yeah. Other than that, I haven't played anything else. Um, there were Gen Con sales. Uh, my youngest daughter's currently in a summer camp that I have to get up at seven 30 in the morning to bring her to. And then I had to pick her up and it happens to be like as far away as my dad's place. Mm -hmm. So that takes a couple hours out of my day and just trying to catch up from vacation as we swamp. So really, I think other than that, the only thing much of either of us have played is Hades, which I finished a run just before playing or coming on. That was my break between getting everything done today and, and going live was playing the video game. Um, but we can't really talk a lot about Hades or else I would like totally be like, oh, let's, yeah, let's have I mean, a Hades conversation. But like there's spoilers. There's things I don't want to know. So yeah, I, I know other people it's, don't want to know. There, there's I'd love to do a. I I keep thinking I should be streaming it when I play. Yeah, I do uh, too, because I would like I to talk it. about it. But at the same time, you know, it's it's we're way past. Although I again, I just saw someone I, yesterday on Twitter. I pointed out uh, who was I'm that? still trying to figure out why my videos. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, who was that? That was oh yeah, James Moy. Um, who had just found just found Hades. <laughs> He's like, I know I'm a thousand years too late, but this is yeah. this Hades is fun. Um, and so it's people are still discovering it, but uh, yeah. no, it's, it's it's good. Like like honestly, I've actually put aside all of the video games right now, which is bad because I have <laughs> games. I've I, I'm having the, the the shelf of shame problem with my video games, which I know lots of people have that with Steam, but like or stuff I got that I totally meant to like, remember me talking about trying the Witcher and starting with number two and like all that. I just sit down and I, I the first, I, I think about it. I'm like, nah, I'll just do a run in Hades and then yeah. maybe another and then maybe <laughs> another. Well, and that's actually one of the reasons why I haven't been so like during the day again for work. Um, I, I, you can stop Hades easy enough. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, but I prefer to play through, um, especially I've found that I kind of forget what boons I've set up and, and you know, what right. combination I've set up if I get away from it for too long. So I have been drifting to other things during the day, but yeah, after 5 PM, if I grab a game, it's almost mm -hmm. always, uh, almost always Haiti. I just broke a hundred runs on my second, on my God mode oh, one. See, so I, I'm now, I, I now actually, I've now actually runs. done over 200 runs wow. between the two. I haven't even hit a hundred runs yet. So yeah, I, I only know the only reason I noticed I was because, uh, um uh hypnos says congrats that's uh, you know i'm only in the 70s so still got a ways to go well you went on vacation and i did some i did some binge runs and got ahead yeah because you. you were you had been well ahead of yeah me i had been one well because ahead. i started yeah. because i started the non-god mode version mm -hmm. anyway uh how yeah, about a look go, ahead? go buy hades yeah, like, yeah like, exactly. it's just good go buy it, it. whatever whatever system yeah yeah whatever you play play it Whatever, whatever you play video games on, you want something solo more fun than size solo. <laughs> I'm sure some people think otherwise, but. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you okay. plan for the coming weeks? So hopefully more gaming, uh, but Tori and Kat are still off being adults with families. So no game night Friday. Um, actually, it ends up the E and I are planning something. We're trying to figure out. OK, anyone local Windsor, is there a hotel or anything in Amherstburg? Like, like I, I tried today for hours. Anyway, then that'll be a, a after after show chat. So anyway, they're done. So and we're not gaming on Friday, though, unless D and I play some games or something. Um, But I do have a bunch of gaming related stuff I want to start doing, uh, which is going to start with unboxing. So last week was Gen Con, right? And a friend of ours and patron of the show, Kevin, uh, I don't know if tech's still in the chat, was down there helping promote Quad Heroes from Ryan Eiler and Wonderman Games. Quad Heroes is fantastic. I would tell you to check out the Kickstarter, but they're going to retry it. Um, they noticed, as we did, that there were far too many backer levels and it was confusing. 
So they are going to relaunch, and they are also going to offer the miniatures separate. So, which kind of, I don't I don't know if Brian or Tech or anyone paid attention to what we said about Quad Heroes, but it kind of feels like it. But maybe we weren't the only people to notice this. So Kevin was the winner of our Grand Gamers Guild giveaway a couple weeks back. And he met up with Mark Spector of Grand Gamers Guild to get his prize. And congrats on that again, Kevin. I hope you dig it. I don't know if you had a chance to play yet. But here's the awesome part. Since he was down there meeting with Mark, Kevin agreed to bring us back some new review stuff from Mark. Finally, some stuff after um, Role Player and Garinto. That's all we've gotten to try it. Not Role Player, Role Camera. Sorry, Role Camera and Garinto. So I actually have a bag here, an awesome board games bag, with a pile of games that I'm going to need to get unboxed and played. So the pile of obligation is jumping up. Now, as for what games? Well, sorry, people listening at home. You're just going to have to stick around for the after show and should have been here live to see. After the after show, too, I've also got a package that showed up. So I don't even know what's in that one. So that's something else that's going to need to be unboxed. And I will just say there's enough stuff. It might be two sessions of unboxings. Now, again, thank you, Kevin, for playing Mule for us. That was fantastic of you. I, I got to appreciate Like that, That's going a step above. That is fantastic. Um, then, of course, following all this, you're going to have rule reading and hopefully some gameplays. Now, a quick shout out and thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. So I know I just did it, but I'm going to do it again in case you skipped the last section. Uh, I got to give a shout out to Kevin Reno. He played Mule for us. Thanks so much for that, Kevin. You are awesome. Zopi, thank you. Brian Sheehan, thanks, Brian. David Miller Jr., thanks. Brian Kurtz, again, he happened to be in the chat earlier, and we got a shout out for him today. That was not pre-planned. Thank you, Brian, for being with us since the start. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Digging the show? You can support us at Patreon.com slash Tabletop Bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and you're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm still Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.